Today we're going to look at an easily and often overlooked emperor, Starachius. He is the son of Nikephorus, and he only reigned for a few short months due to circumstances that were beyond his control. Despite the fact that he was co-emperor for nearly a decade and that his father was a controversial and much discussed figure, Starachius' early life is not well recorded. He was the son of Nikephorus, and we're not really sure who his mother was. Her name is not recorded. His date of birth is generally considered to have been after 778. One um, modern source that I consulted claims that he would have been about 10 to 12 years old in 803, which would have placed his birth at around 793, give or take. Um, he was elevated to become the co-emperor with his father Nikephorus in December of 803, as Nikephorus sought to really solidify his position after dealing with the usurpation. Um, in 807, there was a bride show, and it looks like Nikephorus selected Strachius' bride. He selected Theophano of Athens, and the main reason seems to have been that she was a relative of Irene, so this was a way to bring legitimacy back to the family by trying to reconcile with anyone who might have been upset by Irene's death. Now, we noted that Irene was deeply unpopular. However, she did have some supporters, especially in the church. So, this could have been a way for Nikephorus to try to uh, shore up his position by marrying his son in the family. At any rate, we actually don't know much about Starachis' activities as co-emperor, but it does seem that he was responsible for discharging the expected duties of his office, and the first real instance that we have of him doing something is when he is escorting his father on campaign against the Bulgars in 811. Prior to May of 811, we don't know with any certainty where Starachius was or what he was doing. However, in May of 811, this is when Nikephorus began his fateful invasion of Bulgaria, and on this campaign he decided to bring Starachius and Strachius' brother-in-law Michael along. Now, there was an early victory that the Byzantines won that Nikephorus attributed to Strachius' advice and judgment, and he wrote a communication back to the Senate at, Byzant at Constantinople to just that effect. Now, whether he was just trying to shore up his son's reputation with the people back home, or whether um, Strachius had genuinely given a brilliant piece of advice that had turned out in the favor of the Byzantines is hard to say. However, whatever Starachius' ability and whatever the abilities that his father had shown for several years, apparently neither of them saw the trap that they were walking into. On July 26th, 811, at the Battle of Pliska, Khan Krum managed to lure the Byzantine army into an unfavorable position and inflict a severe defeat upon the Byzantine army. During this battle, Nikephorus was killed in action, and the remnants of his army had to flee as best they could to the protection of Adrianople. Um, during the course of the fighting, Starachius himself was badly wounded. It looks like his spinal cord was severely damaged, and he ended up being crippled from this wound, which in the course of time, after about six months or so, would prove to uh, lead to his death. But at the time, I guess it probably wasn't immediately apparent that this wound would be permanent or fatal, and Starachius is still technically in charge as co-emperor when they arrive at Adrianople. Despite his severe wounds, Starachius was declared sole emperor a couple days after the fateful Battle of Pliska. However, Starachius's friends and advisors did not think that he had all that long to live, and they began to look for potential replacements on the throne. Starachius might have caught wind of this, and he became very suspicious. At one point, he consulted with one of his advisors on the wisdom of having Michael, his brother-in-law, blinded in order to protect his own hold on the throne, but he was dissuaded from this action by that same advisor who, in fact, had already decided to back Michael as the next emperor. While Starachius attempted to govern from his sickbed and tried to come up with ways to shore up his tenuous position, Four senior officials, the Patriarch Nikephorus, the Magister Officiorum Theocistus, the bodyguard captain Stephanus, and Michael Rangabi debated about what to do and who should become the next emperor. At the same time, however, Starachius proposed making Theophano the reigning empress, and 
a way that was reminiscent of the way that Irene had become reigning empress. In this case, however, it would be the emperor actually appointing her rather than having an empress seize power. Now, given the way that the Nikiforan dynasty had started, this is a very odd choice, since, of course, it had been his father, Nikiforus, who had overthrown Irene, and now his son was proposing to leave the empire in the hands of another woman who was Irene's relative. So that was a fairly desperate proposal. And there is also some mention in the sources of Starachius coming up with another scheme which would create something like an imperial democracy. I'm not really clear on exactly what that's supposed to be. It could just be a loose use of terminology by the sources about something that he proposed. Maybe he wanted to form a ruling council or invest power in the Byzantine Senate. Um, I don't know. At any rate, it was clear that Starachius was looking for any way out of this problem other than leaving the office of emperor before he died. By October 2nd, 811, Strachius no longer had any need for far-fetched schemes of imperial succession, as on that day, news reached him that the Senate had just declared Michael as the new emperor. Um, Strachius was in no condition to contest this, so he simply abdicated in order to save his own life, and he took monastic vows. Michael agreed to let him live out his life, short as that was going to be. It's really hard to assess the legacy of someone who only ruled for three months and was barely able to exercise power within that time. But from what little we can gather about Starachius, he seems to have had a very strong will as evidenced by how hard he tried to come up with creative ways to retain his power. And it's also possible, if Nikephorus's report was to be believed, that his son Starachius did have some degree of tactical talent even if that was not sufficiently developed to save them from disaster at Pliska. If, um, you know, a lot of modern scholars write and Nikephorus was only about 20 or so, then we have to wonder what he could have become if he had that natural tactical talent and he has this iron will and a lot of the intelligence of his father Nikephorus. What could he have gone on to become had he survived the disaster? At any rate, um, he didn't really survive the disaster in any meaningful way and ended up dying of gangrene or some other infection from his battle wounds on January 11th, 812. Um, of all the people we've covered so far, I think that Starachius' life is one of the richest in terms of the alternate history possibilities. But at any rate, um, he didn't really end up doing all that much in his lifetime due to bad luck. So I'll leave it there, and next time we'll discuss the life of Michael I Rangabi, Starachius' much luckier brother-in-law.